so everyone, thank you for joining us in our part two on lithium and batteries, mining and refining. We'll try to keep uh, some of the early stuff really quick just to be able to get through the content because we're going a couple of minutes late. So um, we're uh, Jeff and I together are a uh, form an entity called Battery Talk, and we give these presentations on different topics in sort of energy storage, mostly lithium ion, lithium metal, uh, battery related topics on kind of companies and technologies. And our goal is to really just sort of give back the information that we learn in our jobs to everybody else so they can better understand kind of some of the unspoken and hidden things and, and kind of give some analysis that you don't necessarily see um, generally online and kind of for free because we both do a lot of consulting and VC due diligence types type of work. So we try to kind of apply that to public information and then put those up available for people because um, it's fun for us and we hope it's interesting for you. Uh, everything that we talk about is basically our our opinion with public information, which is yeah. very important that I caveat that with because we both have a lot of NDAs that we have to be careful of. <laughs> you watched our last video. Basically, this is a quick summary from a recap from part one. So we won't spend a lot of time here. Um, but the key takeaways, right, guys, is demand has increased drastically. For a 60 kilowatt hour pack, you're looking at nine kilos of lithium. Different chemistries are going to use lithium uh differently and either more or less efficiently, depending on which cathode chemistry you choose from, you know, nine half half to six two two, right? Um, and then the supply chain itself is you have to circle the globe a couple of times. And a good example of that is uh, sp uh, sputamine or spudamine, depending on how you pronounce it, um, comes from Australia to be mined and it's actually sent to China for Chinese refining. Um, so like that's an example of where you see stuff moving across the globe, which just adds cost and everything else. And pollution, which which is sort of important. We'll get to that near the end of the presentation. But anyway, so jumping right in to this presentation. Um, one thing we didn't talk about last time was basically lithium carbonate equivalent, which is a very important topic in understanding when you're talking about basically the mining to refining to usage, because the type of lithium that is basically where it starts, what it's turned into, and what that can be used for are very critical, but also because people talk about different types of lithium, the hydroxides and the carbonates, and the lithium metal, basically being able to navigate navigate between the three of them when you're talking about bulk lithium availability and production is really important. Yeah, so like in a practical understanding of that, right, guys, lithium hydroxide, which is used for your high nickel content batteries, would require 1.544 LCE. Lithium carbonate, uh, which is primarily used straight in LFP batteries, you're looking at one LCE. And then if you're doing lithium metal, like uh, Cuber or SES or any of the lithium metal players, you're looking at 5.32 LCE. So uh, when people talk about lithium required, they're generally talking lithium carbonate equivalent. So you have to know how to uh, multiply those numbers to give you accurate units of what your supply or uh, consumption needs will be. So you know, lithium metal's got a five times multiplier, right? So if you think about it from that context, you need five times the LCE to make one lithium metal battery with the same capacity as a LFP battery. Okay. Although it gives you more juice. So it's all trade-offs. As far as lithium types and sources, guys, we'll be going over it a little bit today. So there's really three things uh, lithium comes from. You're either going to get it from a hard rock mine, uh, which is pretty traditional. You're going to get it from a brine or you're going to get it from a clay. Clays are kind of like the, uh, it's really clays and like direct lithium extraction or the new frontiers. Uh, we'll go into direct lithium extraction later, but lithium clays are, are being looked at uh, more from a studies uh, aspect to try and get it additional resources for lithium, but they tend to have a lower content. Um, the thing though, is like lithium is not naturally found in nature, right? So you're not going to find pure lithium just sitting around. What you're going to find is usually uh, lithium containing compounds. Uh, like, so spudamine, right, is lithium aluminum silica hexaoxide. Um, and that is then made into a lot of things. So, what I've gone ahead and done is starting to show you guys kind of the ranges for each of these minerals and how much you're expected to get with that. And then on the bottom left, we have a nice table that shows you their geographical location. And there's a map that'll show that as well. The reality, guys, is like if you're doing hard rock mining and you're doing stuff like spudgamine, right, it really depends on what you mine and what you ore or what you mine and the ore you get, right? Some ore will give you more, some ore will give you less. So it's really hard to predict if you have 10 truckloads how much ore you're going to get. It's probably going to be some average or some median value with a conservative factor applied to it. As far as the breakdowns, this is kind of important. So from the lithium mineral sides, which is your spudgamines or just rather a pegamatite, 
uh, you get your mineral concentrates. Those go into your glass and ceramics after the, the um, refining and mining process. And then it makes hydroxide and carbonate. Um, and this will come up later and be important. Those go both into batteries, oils, and pharmacy and other stuff. Brines are a little bit different. So uh, brines will actually make lithium carbonate and lithium chloride. And this is where they distinguish each other. You can make lithium carbonate into lithium hydroxide. Um, and you can make lithium carbonate into lithium chloride, right? So, but the reason this is important is because to do the conversion, it's an additional cost step. So lithium chloride is actually what is needed to make pure lithium metal batteries. So if you want directly the shortest path to a lithium metal battery, right, you would go from brine to lithium chloride to li metallic lithium and then into those batteries. Whereas if you're trying to do that from the spudgamine side, you'd have to go from the spudgamine to lithium carbonate to then convert to lithium chloride to then convert to metallic lithium. And this is important because it dictates essentially the pathways companies are taking when they determine whether they're going straight to a mine or a brine. Okay, I'll jump to the next slide. So um, this one shows the lithium availability and you can see that it is fairly limited in um, sort of where you can get it from. And you'll also see kind of the brines here versus the mines availability. But then you'll also see who's exporting, right? Which again, limited a lot, a, basically a lot of South America um, and um, uh, Australia. And then you'll see that, um, you know, the people importing <laughs> are different. And, and kind of the, the one place that's interesting is all the battery factories going in in Europe where there really aren't any sources. And so you're basically, you're mining somewhere else, you're sending somewhere for refining somewhere else, and then you're shipping to get potentially a third place for the actual, you know, battery assembly, and then integration to the car and then shipping the car and then using the car. And these all really impact the cost and also the pollution in those supply chains. Yeah. And, and you know, the kind of the thing here, right, guys, is, is a lot of these what are circled as net exporters. So you see like the lithium triangle, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, they are trying to become self-producers as well. Right. And that and we'll go over a little bit about that later. Next one. Okay. And and thank you for the comments. So, so one of the problems whenever you're doing stuff like this, and so so, so we had um uh Zha Jing just, just bring up that you know there's there are some projects that aren't on here, which is when you're using public information, you're always looking at stuff that's like one or two years old. That's not the things that are planned and projected, because a lot of times those are a little bit harder to find or unknown or not listed in conveniently available great graphics online. Yeah. We try to do everything publicly, everyone, so that we don't like I have access to different maps, but I cannot use those maps is a good way to say it. Yeah. And to answer the other question, the answer is I have no idea, Antonio, if it includes the ones in Norway. Probably not. <laughs> as far um, as location and availability, guys, so this is a, a cool one we found uh, from uh, one of the websites, and it kind of gives you a rough overall of the situation, which is there's a certain production capacity by each country that really has a huge uh, amount of these resources, and there's a certain amount of reserves. Um, and you can kind of see it tailored up here, right? So like if you're looking at like the US who is really big into batteries right now, they're actually significantly behind. And this is as of 2019. So some projects have come online, uh, but we'll cover the um, projected timelines with that later as well. Um, the reality is that they're, we're basically behind. Right. So like what we expect to see is lots of lithium productions or projects popping up in Argentina, Chile and Brazil, as they have a huge concentration there. And it's a pretty untapped area. Leibniz is currently down there um, setting up factories and helping out the Argentinian government with mining and refining. Um, we're probably going to see Australia, who is kind of ahead of everyone um, as one of the largest production producers and has not the largest reserve, but a good reserve relative to each other country start to break away from other refining operations. Um, that would be my guess in the near future is they tend to solidify the white gold uh, that they have in reserve. And then, um, you know, the reality of this, guys, is a lot of these countries aren't battery producers, right? And in an age where everybody is trying to go for vertical integration, right, um, technical experts are going to be in high demand. Um, and that's even within a company, right? So, like, for example... Livens right now working in Argentina and they're setting up hard rock mines. The reality is that although that uses standard equipment that uses standard everything else, the minerals, the dirt, everything they're using there is not the same as a hard rock mine, let's say in Australia, 
So there are going to be slight and subtle changes in the process, and you can't just copy paste. You know, there's no control C, control B for every hard rock mine across all areas of production. And that's yeah, why you see a lot of projects actually. And there are a lot of places where there are resources where there is technically lithium, like, you know, the Salton Sea in California, where it is really hard to get it out because it's 600 degrees C and it's full of other toxic crap. And so the difficulty and cost to get access to some of the lithium resources um, really vary drastically by what type of lithium is there and kind of what the environment is and kind of for some of the different methods, basically access to um, local people to work it, local water for brines, and, and and local power to basically be able to run the processes. And those can be a, a really cha a big challenge in actually being able to set up the mining and refining systems. Mm -hmm. okay. As far so as we're going to jump, we're going to jump right into the first sort of form of the mining, which is hard rock mining. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. So the first one's hard rock mining. Um, basically, it's kind of like the pictures say you have a quarry, you have open extraction. Sometimes it's underground and you have the actual mine where they have to go into. The real benefit to this guy is, is the uh, flexibility um, that hard rock mines provide in terms of their outputs. So, for example, we had the slide earlier which showed that uh, hard rock mines can produce either lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. Those are the two primary uh, consumers right now in the battery and the electric vehicle world, right? Lithium metal hasn't been a proven technology. There is no lithium metal company producing at scale right now. So everybody's looking at LFP and they're looking at NMC or some derivative of that. Um, the reality of that is that means that they're looking really at lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide only as their inputs. And if you're an NMC high nickel, you're looking at lithium hydroxide. And then, you know, let's take CATL, for example. Um, they produce both LFP batteries and NMC batteries, so they're probably going to preference the shortest path, which is using a hard rock mine. Um, there's another advantages with hard rock mines, guys. One is faster processing. Brines have the natural uh, solar evaporation they have to deal with, which has its own advantages, uh, which we'll get into later. Um, and then usually the hard rock mines have higher lithium content relative to the brines. Um, so, you know, kind of in conclusion, right, we see, expect to see companies focus on NMC working with mines while companies developing LFP. We'll probably talk to brine companies because there's a slight cost advantage to the, the brining operation. Um, one other thing is compatibility. So uh, the beauty of doing a hard rock mine as your first project is the equipment doesn't, you know, it's already there. You're not inventing the wheel. Mining equipment is mining equipment, and it's been around for a very long time. And it's in plentiful supply for other industries as opposed to something more specific that you're going to have to build out to support the you know, lithium refining and especially the direct lithium extraction, some of those technologies. So the one other caveat here to work to talk about is, you know, there are ways of, of going between, you know, the different types of lithium once you've already kind of captured the, the carbonate or the hydroxide, but those are slow and expensive. And so once you kind of have your end product of, of carbonate or hydroxide, you don't tend to want to switch them to the other, but it is possible. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more with the direct lithium extraction later in the presentation. So brine evaporation. Uh, yeah, so uh, brines guys are basically, there's three, um, since we're halfway through, there's three ways to get lithium. You either have hard rock mines or you have brines, and then there's two subset categories of brines. There's basically brines and direct lithium extraction. Direct lithium extraction isn't proven, and I'll go over later. Uh, but brines are basically where you go to an area that has uh, essentially a salt-rich reserve. You pump, you drill into the ground, into that salt-rich water. You pump it to the surface into a large set of these evaporation ponds. You can kind of see in the uh, photos below. And then you use uh, solar uh, to evaporate it over a number of months in order to concentrate it to a level where you can start refining it. Um, the problem... You know, if we're looking at what the whole point of the EV industry, right, is to be net neutral on carbon, right, and be uh, green and all of those other things that we use, LFP is a safer, greener battery, et cetera. Uh, the water usage for a lot of these brines that use solar evaporation is pretty, uh, pretty water intensive, and it usually impacts the hydrological cycle. So, like, for example, uh, Chile's Atacama uh, Solar, which is solar is just their version of brine and um Chilean? I don't know what Chile speaks. Spot? Anyone? Chilean um, is an example of that. And it's up for debate, right? So you have a lot of conflicting studies uh, either saying it's 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 too intensive or, or it should be sustainable by the current uh, area around it. But as far as um, 
Brian's are concerned. The one advantage that they generally have over uh, other processes is that they're a little bit easier to get to uh, relatively speaking to the hard rock. Um, you don't have some of the challenges of having to constantly dig into the earth and create tunnels and then pull things out and set up support structures and then keep going further and further to keep getting out the ore or the mineral. Top left, though, uh, just wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of what the brine process is, right? There's pretreatment, calcium removal, and then it kind of goes into the whole uh, making your way down. This is a consolidated version. We'll have one later in the presentation that kind of shows you the entire flow chart between uh, spudgamine and brine and what they flow into their technical crates. But one thing I think, Aubert, you want to talk about is, is, is definitely the water usage. Yeah, and so, you know, basically, you, you always have to look at all the other trade-offs, everything else, and, and we have another slide, I think, next that'll, is that the one that ties the, no, no. it's later on, but basically, um, you know, there's, there's timeline trade-offs for using the brines versus the other methods, and then basically, the, the biggest one is basically the water usage, so you get kind of a much slower process that sort of, once you have the land set up, it's sort of cheap to do, you pump the water in, you wait, you gather the stuff, you ship it out. But again, you're basically constantly flowing water out of the sources that have the access to the brine. You're flowing them into the ponds continually and you're, you're flowing them out continually. And you know the, the wastewater has impacts on the local environment. And, and you basically have to have access to a lot of clean water to do this. Um, and you have to be somewhere that's, you know, typically places where you find lithium are by nature, they're arid. And so you have basically the trouble of having to find and pump water from somewhere else into a desert or arid region to then use it and then typically dispose of the water afterwards somewhere local where it's not costing a lot of money to ship it back somewhere else and you're usually not cleaning it. And so it's just, it's very disruptive environmentally right. and a lot of debate on that, on how much and why and does it hurt the animals and the plants, but um, the access to the water and the amount of water they use is kind of one of the bigger costs of this technology for, for the for mining. Hmm. All right. So Correct. lithium extraction. Um, so why direct lithium extraction? Basically, and we'll go into this later, it takes a long time to get lithium to the consumer. Um, and, and like many of the things, you are trying to shorten timelines uh, to get it. And on the bottom left, you kind of can see that a conventional brine uh, takes about two years um, from extraction to uh, including extraction, but to the resource, and then it goes out. And this assumes a fully validated process. Um, whereas direct lithium, it, it, it only takes a few hours. Now, you still have the shipping, and that'll be the same regardless of which process you use, the logistics, because that's just ports and ships and everything else. Uh, but with a lot of the difficulty in accessing the hard rock minerals, even if they favorably have the ingredients you want for batteries today, um, and the water intensity, a lot of companies are looking at this. And there's really for a few reasons. One, it's perceived to be less impactful for the environment or less water intensive. Two, there's a kind of a lower carbon production component of it because you have potentially less solvent usage. You're using different methods to pull it out. So you have less cleaning and refining that is uh, not green on the environment. Water consumption we went over in part of the environment. It can be powered by renewable energy, which is one of their selling points, but I don't really see that being a thing as, you know, technically a brine is doing this already um, with the natural sun. Big thing is reduced time and then the efficiency is way up. So uh, they get much higher efficiency. Some people will claim 90%. Reality is if you look at like all the papers and stuff, it's about 70 to 80%. And they use a couple different methods of doing it. So this is so new right now in the industry. There's a few things deployed right now. Um, and I can go over that on the next slide. But there's a few categories, which is they're going to be using sieves, sorbents, solvent, liquid, liquid, or selective membranes, potentially nanofiltration, or switchable ion exchanges. And, so, and some of them use multiple, and they have different orders. And there's, there's basically, there's a lot of different companies right now looking at basically what is the best way and the most economic way to deploy these. And again, on the different basically sources of lithium, where sometimes you basically need actually a different, uh, you know, process technique, uh, uh, equipment pathway to get what you want out of it correctly, right? So there's not a great apples to apples comparison when you're actually dealing with different base lithium access from different sources in different locations. Yeah, and this kind of goes over here, the, the available 
uh, methods that we just discussed and kind of their pros and cons advantages. What you'll see here is a lot of it is requires additional processing step or environmental impact or high upfront cost um, or limit to, you know, water intensive or stuff like that. The reality is that the current uh, most deployed method, and I think it's deployed in Chile right now, is absorption, um, which is it, it's a pretty simple process. Basically, you have resin beads with a certain pore structure. Uh, those get thrown in with the salts as they're going through a uh, essentially a transfer carrier. The resin beads pick up and uh, absorb the salts essentially through surface energy. Essentially, if you have something with a small enough pore, its surface energy is extremely high and you get a nano deposition or deposition of that on into or onto the pores. Um, and then those are collected through a filter mesh as the rest of the water keeps running. So you kind of have like a mesh with a bunch of these beads. They float around in the tank. They absorb all these things. Once those are collected, uh, essentially what they do is they go through a purification or a washout process. So essentially you hit it with like a very dilute lithium chloride solution that kind of kills off and reacts with anything that is in there that you may not want. Uh, purge that out and then you're usually running like hot water to open up the resin to get everything to expand and then release out um, all the salts that you want. Um, so that's the current uh, favored one, but the problem with it is uh, essentially two things. One, there's a high upfront cost of setting up those systems, and then there's two uh, is the additional processing steps and then the resin beads themselves. There's no, right, there's going to be a lot of tuning of what is the correct nano porous particle of resin that I make to capture this efficiently, and then who is going to make that for you and at scale. Yeah, and one, one thing just to highlight, we talk about it more later, but, you know, high, high upfront costs basically mean, you know, high CapEx equipment, right, where you have to purchase them to set up to start. And, you know, there is some offset where with like the IRA, they are funding a lot of these types of technologies in the United States where, you know, if you get a $50 million, you know, IRA grant that really helps you overcome that high upfront cost. And then all of them that say low operating cost there's a lot of assumptions built into those that we're not going to be able to go into in this video, but basically they're assuming it works and that they're not going to have to constantly replace systems. Like you see the corrosion to equipment under the solvent extraction one. A lot of these will have similar problems where the pipes are going to clog, the things are going to corrode, there's going to be issues. And so there's going to be sort of a lot of downtime, maintenance, replacement parts. And for things where you're using you know, ion exchanger membranes, those are replaceable. You have to swap them out. And, and like Jeff said, you're going to have to have a large quantity, you know, of high quality uh, so source for it uh, to be able to run these economically and efficiently without problems. So. As far as direct lithium extraction, this is kind of for educational um, everyone else. This isn't any, uh, this does not real life, and I want to preface this, any kind of practical brine conditions. Um, this is all data harvested from literature and taken from literature. Uh, but the idea here is kind of just to create the idea that there's a lot of these different processes. They all have different amounts of uh, lithium recovery associated with them. And you can see that in the spreads of roughly like a standard deviation of 20%. All these different me methods, it looks like regardless of who's doing the experiment, has kind of a different water consumption rate. Uh, it's, it's almost a point, guys, where like as we, you know, I go through and I have to read you know, direct lithium extraction publications and I have to go through the data and it's almost like everybody, it's it's just like, it feels like it's reading a battery paper again, uh, <laughs> like 10 years ago, right? Everyone's publishing their special sauce and it's always X plus X, X percent of competitors. The reality is probably that a lot of the companies like Liven have more accurate data of what method is the best. And that's why you see them deploying the absorption method. Uh, but the absorption method, right, is projecting to be in effect 2025 to 2023. So they basically, they're saying within the next six years, they're going to have this deployed in Chile and Argentina. Um, and, and, and again, and we're going to keep saying this, but basically the, 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 the different base lithium resources that you have to process really do make a, a big difference. And so, again, what works for, for one, you know, one mine, one type of lithium in one location will not be the right solution for another. So there, there is a place for multiple solutions and multiple technologies, and we're kind of in the wild west right now figuring out what those are for each of the lithium resources. So, you know, there, there, there could be a lot of promising techniques, and, you know, we're, we're going to see as people kind of dial those in, a lot of money thrown at it, and we'll see which ones kind of stick around and are successful or not. Mm-hmm.
this here, not to spend a lot of time, guys, uh, but this is just a great overview of the, the methods that we kind of presented for direct lithium extraction. This is from Goldman Sachs. It kind of gives you the comparison between hard rock mining and then evaporation versus DLE for a specific, uh, for the specific processes. So it's kind of giving you like, what are the recovery rates, right? You can see with hard rock mining, you got higher recovery rates than you do with brine. And DLE is even higher than that. The processes used and then kind of the land requirements, water consumption, energy, and emissions uh, that are associated with it in terms of each individual process. Um, when reading this report, one of the interesting things I came across uh, of is if you look at the CAPEX for both brine and evaporation, they're actually the same, um, whereas the OPEX is actually slower for the uh, direct lithium extraction, but the the same rate for the CAPEX is interesting because basically when Goldman Sachs did that math, they were accounting for the fact that because you have higher efficiencies, it means your equipment is cheaper in the future. Um, and that's kind of a, a weird trick where people are starting to compare things to make it look good to each other. But in reality, the initial upfront cost of direct lithium extraction is going to be far higher than an evaporation pond. Yeah, and I think they'll also find like, you know, one thing I always think about when I look at stuff like this, which is, you know, a model that should work really well, but for whatever reason doesn't. And so um, when you look at solar energy capture with a solar tower and then the heliostats around it beaming energy to the tower or, you know, the trough system where you're pumping the molten salt back and forth between them, you know, the, the, the trough system was more insurable. So that's even though it was more expensive, but then you have this horrendous molten salt clogging all the pipes that constantly have to be replaced and everything just slows down and becomes so much less efficient and so much more costly to operate. And so I, I'm very curious the equivalent of what will happen here, because again, you're, you're dealing with lithium, which is highly reactive and you're dealing, you're dealing with salts, which are highly corrosive. And so no matter which of the versions you're dealing with or what the other external toxic heat problems of where you're getting your materials from, you know, it's hard. It, it, there's a lot of potential ways that you can screw up your equipment and have slowdowns, breakdowns, replacements that are not being factored in here. So we're, we'll, we'll see how that goes um, as they start, uh, you know, st start producing and we'll see what the yield kind of ends up being and of, of the efficiency of these factories. Kind of the players in the field, I know uh, we got someone here from Lithium Americas, got them listed, um, but basically it's kind of almost like an uh, oligarchy or oligolop, I can't say that word, uh, structure. Basically, you know, kind of what I would expect guys near term in the Lithium field as far players, are, uh, as, far as players are concerned, I'd expect a lot of new players uh, promoting some sort of direct Lithium extraction technology that yields some ridiculous number of uh, recovery and efficiency. Um, since it's such an interest right now, the reality is the incumbents are going to dominate. Um, Albemarle is going to dominate, Liven is going to dominate, TNT is going to dominate, Lithium Americas is in there, and they're going to hedge out more of a share. Um, and then what uh, we were thinking of, and which was really interesting, is you're going to see kind of the countries making uh, resource plays for better control of their white gold. So we're calling it the OLEC uh, situation versus OPEC. Um, where they look to essentially bring it in. And you see that actually in Argentina right now with Livent, where Livent is basically being, having to teach Argentinian scientists how to do the processes because Argentina wants to start producing batteries themselves. Okay. And we have eight sl more slides after this to get to in six minutes. So I'm gonna, we're going to try to go a little bit faster through the rest of these. And per normal, we will be coming back after this to talk about you, talk to you guys more and field questions. And if we don't get to something in the next five and a half minutes, we will uh, cover it then. So yeah. this is a beautiful refining process diagram that Jeff put together from a lot of different sources and papers. But basically what you can see here is you can see the basically the way you go to and from the different final lithium resources, the final steps involved in it, and basically from the starting point to the end point, how you get to everything. And so you you see the you know the the lithium chloride, you see the um, you know lithium car lithium carbonate technical grade, the battery grade, which is even harder, and the same thing for the lithium hydroxide. And there's a lot on this page if you can just stare at it and you know kind of continually learn about what's taken out, what's put in and what different processes are used. Um, I'm going to give Jeff 10 seconds to talk about anything else he wants to talk about in this page, and then we're skipping to the next one. No, I, I mean, it would take too long to really comment on this individually, but basically this is a flow diagram. Uh, feel free to, to screenshot it. That's what I'd recommend. Um, and then, you know, digest it on your own time. <laughs> okay. 
So there are a lot of differing opinions on the quantities that will be available in supply, the quantities that will be needed in demand, where those are going to be from, where those are going to be refined and used, what a number of EVs and where those are going to be made out of, and the costs associated with all of that. And you know, it, it it there's pretty big ranges. You know, people and, and again, this is where you really have to understand the the LCE because um, some people talk about the pure lithium and some people talk about LCE and some people are talking about lithium carbonate and some people are talking about hydroxide. And so you you kind of have to find that and then change the numbers to understand and compare. Um, but you know, the, the kind of the key takeaway is you know there there were ten you know ten point six million EVs sold in twenty twenty two. And that's 663,000 tons of lithium carbonate, right? And so you divide that by that, what, 5.31, and that gets you the actual tons of lithium uh, that were being used. So it's uh, the, the, one of the previous slides, actually the next slide has uh, a better map on that. So we'll talk about that next. But um, basically the, the world capacity right now is way less than what we, we think we're going to be using in the future, but people disagree about how much that is and you know do we need five times or ten times more basically in the next you know sort of seven to ten years anything else you want to say on this one jeff no i'm good okay and i, I think um the, the main takeaway from this is you know there's still an enormous number of factories being announced you know this is just the us one but uh, across the world and, you know, the, the, there's a great quote from Simon Moore, which is, and this is optimistic, by the way, but it takes four to seven years to build a lithium mine, and it takes 24 months to build a battery plant, right? And so those are two very different scales. And when you add the permitting and the zoning, and then you also add the refining on top of that, it's just an enormous difference in time on what it takes to bring the supply side of it online versus the demand side. Yeah, so this is kind of the rat race, guys. Um, 2023, where we're at, demand is going up. This is being driven primarily by EVs, grid projects, consumer applications, uh, even military to some extent. Um, and it's, you know, the reality is everybody is competing for the same resource and supply, right? NMC producers are competing. LFP, lithium metal companies are looking to get contracts with people. Solid state companies need some sort of lithium to make their solid state um, powder. And the reality we have to ask ourselves, is the demand realistic uh, for what is actually possible given the current supply chain? Um, so this kind of breaks it down, guys, uh, where you're looking at uh, LC equivalent on the image in the right, but we converted it to pure lithium on the left so we can kind of give people an idea of the mineral demand. So to meet demand 2035 numbers, on average, you would be looking at deltas in the millions of tons right? Like you would have a 5x increase in lithium production in the next decade or a little bit more. And to kind of put this in perspective for you guys, in the history of the world, we have never doubled production of a material in a decade. I just want you to think about that. And we're asking to 5x it. So you can go fact check that if you want, but Pretty sure I think, I think you got that from Peter Zahan, so you could go fact check him. Yeah, <laughs> it's Peter Zahan's quote. Uh, but basically, it's fantastic. Like, you know, if you if you want to see more about other materials and supplies, he has some great resources. Sodium ion could relieve some of that lithium demand. Yes, um, that's true. We'll, we'll, we we do mention that uh, in the back. Um, so we're backtracking slightly, and this is one of the other kind of actually like meat and potatoes parts of the presentation, right? And, and it's really the timelines that it takes from, you know, idea conception that we want a new mine or refining facility to, with conventional restrictions and permitting and timelines and standard processes. So, so not all the new direct lithium extraction stuff, but sort of a standard mine standard refinery. These are the timelines that it actually takes people to do. Caveats, they're longer in the U.S. than other places and stuff like that, but we, um, I'm going to let Jeff kind of go through some of the specifics here. And it's, it's really interesting just to look at, again, you know, 20, 24 months to build a, a gigafactory, four to seven years minimum for a mine, but that is, does not include the refining capacity or in many cases the permitting. Yeah, and the the reality here, guys, is permitting is kind of the big fluff factor here. So this this one assumes, or this whole chart assumes, you don't know what you're doing. 
right? So we're assuming you're a new company, you're going to go and have, you know, screen sites, have pre-feasibility studies, bankable feasibility studies, and then you're going to have to do some level of R&D because you're dealing with dirt you've never seen before in your life. And you're going to have to hard minerals you've never dealt with before in your life. And you're going to have to figure out how to efficiently extract that all. And there's going to be some sort of basic engineering permitting. Um, the reality here, guys, is the big thing here is the permitting. Uh, so in the States, it's like seven to 10 years. Uh, everywhere else, it's one to two. So this is actually showing the one to two um, as an option here, whereas in the States, it's actually going to be a two-year stint or seven to 10-year stint. So if your whole game plan was like, we're going to bank on the U.S. opening up mines uh, immediately, uh, it, 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 like even if they get the benefit of a doubt to go into a new site and start actually getting stuff done is going to take you a long time. And there's a lot. There's like the uh, Tian Key has a project uh, that they were supposed to be delivering in 2020 and they haven't yet. Um, there's a few other projects as well that are great examples of this where they they planned like 2016, 2019, and they may have sent out uh, deliverable samples, but they aren't actually at production because nobody wants to buy the deliverable samples. And this kind of circles back to that Everywhere you go geographically is going to have a different makeup of what your input is, and you have to figure out what is best way to efficiently process that input. And which output you want to make. Exactly. To that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of a mess, honestly. Um, and, you know, the reality is nobody is going to take up a new mine unless you've qualified it, right? So even here where it's, you know, approval of commercial product, I'm saying it's taking a year and a half right? A lot of people have longer qualification times than that uh, to vet out. I mean, think of how long a battery cycles when you start getting into like long-term cycling, um, whether you've hit the correct stats. So there's a lot here, um, but the idea, right, is that it's it's a pretty intensive timeline. And I think the states, unfortunately, is going to have to address this in some way, um, either by reducing the permits or people are going to have to figure out direct lithium extraction and just eat the cost. Um, to meet the demand. Uh, but that's not going to be sustainable. That's going to be like the streaming services where they're always running at a deficit um, and the consumer won't pay more once they start trying to increase the prices. Mm -hmm. well, well, one quick example, and not to pick on Lilac, it's just the only example I have at the tip of my tongue, but they did a project where they were trying to figure out how to basically successfully extract from the lithium resources in California in the molten sea. And ultimately, the, it basically they failed because it's, again, I mentioned in earlier part of the talk, an example, and, and this is their example, but um, it's, you know, 600 degrees F when it comes out. So it's molten and it's full of other toxic chemicals. And so just the extra hurdles they had to overcome to get to that lithium and successfully and safely um, basically set up the whole process to extract it out and refine it. It was just too hard and too expensive. And so they, they abandoned that one and switched to something else. And there will be resources like that where there, there is lithium, even plentiful lithium, and they did not have access, right? And if you want to say specifics about that, because I'm only talking about it in a video, um, somebody's raising their hand. Yeah, if you want to say something about it, sure, right now is a good time to say a few words about that if you want to. Uh, yeah, know. just and since you mentioned is, is Zhao Jing. Zhao Jing, yeah. Since okay. you mentioned Lilac, uh, first apologies, I, I missed your I missed your LinkedIn message. Um, before, um, but back to this, Lilac has another project in Argentina and their partner just put out uh, a definite or updated pre-feasibility study that um, had a more concrete outline of the production or construction time or, and just timeline overall and the um, CAPEX and OPEX. Um, and again, you guys already mentioned this is our highly project specific. There's a lot going to what CAPEX and OPEX are other than the technology itself, like the jurisdiction, the road, the infrastructure, um, power, water, accessibility. Lo 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 so, local government bribes, yeah, all the good stuff. You find the tumbleweed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's... So, so I know you guys already covered that, but my, my, my point here is like, if you're interested, check that out and see, see if Lilac still claims um, and that they're uh, what they still claims nowadays. 
Yeah. So sure, absolutely. And they they have other projects they're working on now, which I don't have at the tip of my tongue to talk about that do seem like they're going to be more successful. So I'm not trying to pick on Lilac. I'm just trying to, it's more to oh, point. No, 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 no. You, you, will, you, will allow, you will want to see that. I'm not saying you're picking on Lilac. You, you actually made your, this is a great point. No, like, um, no, the other project, it's it's a lot longer than what they previously have discussed or at least give people the impression of and takes a lot of more money. Um, i just give you a quick example. It actually costs double just for CapEx and not, that does not include the power um, to just get half of the pro production as some of the current um, operational or new newly operating mines. Perfect. And, and there's three more hands up right now. And I'm curious, are those things you want to say right now about this topic? Or are they things I can wait four to five minutes till we finish the presentation to get to? Okay. So, so, so Jim Trudeau, you want to say something right now? Go ahead. No, no, five minutes. Okay. Per perfect. Five minutes. Great. I, I thought your hand was going up like right now. Okay, great. And same thing for Oliver right now. Yeah. I, 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 I had a question on this slide, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. So um, new to the area, what does DFS mean? as the acronym for bank before bank bankable feasibility study it should mean direct feasibility study direct definitive feasibility. definitive oh, sorry definitive, definitive. feasibility, definitive. feasibility okay. study yeah like the reality is you always do a free and then you have a definitive one um and then you that's what you kind of take when you need money yeah, the, 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 like in any financial exercise, first they want to pay like 5k for a quick study, yes no maybe, then the 20k study for a, you know, better yes or no and then the full study for how do you do yes right you know that that's sort of the <laughs> the way anything works right yeah and and it seems to me that you know if you put the feasibility and the 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 dfs together that's 5 years is there any ability to shorten that i mean it's it's highly specific right you, you, like let's say you find the world's greatest resource of lithium in a local spot and it happens to also have a tumbleweed that only grows in that spot or an indian indian burial ground and you may be like hey nobody cares about this tumbleweed we will move it somewhere else and it, it and it'll be fine and it's done with zang in a year then imagine it's an indian burial ground Oops. But by the way, the, t the tumbleweed's a real example, and that problem has not been resolved. That's a big problem. Yeah, that, so we're not saying the tumbleweed. There is a, where is it? It's in Reno, Nevada, or Sparks? Uh, no, somewhere in Nevada, uh, Timothy Buckwheat. Yeah, yeah, the Timothy Buckwheat's a real example. Uh, but basically, they, I forget who the company is, they went out and they bought a ton of land. Ioneer. Which one? Uh, Ioneer. Yeah, Ioneer went out, bought a bunch of land. And there happened to be a buckwheat tumbleweed thing on it that only grew in the United States in that one very specific location. And they have been fighting the like environmentalists for eons and it's not resolved. So like you could get unlucky and your timeline is now a decade. So, so that makes sense, but isn't that permitting time? Why is that in the feasibility time? Uh, oh, that, that's additional on top of the feasibility study yeah. time, I think, right? You, that, that's sort of the comment is that makes it even worse. But a, a lot of these, again, they, they just, they're scalar. And, so, you know, sometimes you can do things on top of each other. Sometimes they're unfortunately sequential. That depends on maybe appetite for risk also for the companies, how much capital they have, how quickly they can move, how big their investors are. If it's, you know, yeah. CATL goes, we need a local resource in the United States for our lithium. And they go, here's a billion dollars, do it now. It goes faster, right? If it's a startup that has to do step 1.01A to then get the funds for 1.01B, it goes slower. Also, right. like, right, in your pre-visibility study, that can include a, some of the basic engineering later, right? Is this thing that we're getting out of the ground actually useful for us? Uh, you know, in the permitting, right, that, uh, like you pointed out, may be taken in that stage. But before that, in kind of the feasibility or the definitive feasibility study, you're going to the actual tribe and saying, hey, is it good if I exhume and relocate? Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, you know, the, Zhao Jing brings up a great point is this is a, like, worst to best, like, there's a 15 year delta, if you look at the spreads on all the ranges here. And that could even be shorter or longer, depending if you find a tumbleweed or if you, you know, you get everything running and you have the government supporting you, right? 
it's very different based on those situations. But even if you if you take away those like unknown factors and say at best, I have the US government on my side, they're demolishing every permitting railway in my way. Once you get there, you're still looking at seven years maybe to say you have a fully qualified technical grade product at best. So it just doesn't match up, right? If we're in 2023 and you're saying, I have to be hitting the bullseye everything I do to meet 2030 demand, that's a really unrealistic expectation. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, the, the million caveats on everything here, right? And the other one is a lot of the gigafactories are going slowly too. So it's a, maybe a little bit more time until some of that stuff hits also. Maybe the demand won't be there. We were talking about that earlier at the very beginning of the brunch where, you know, there's a lot of EVs sitting on car lots that are not moving right now. You know, million yeah. caveats. And, and you, you know, if I go back just real quick, uh, if I go back like five slides to more than five slides, there's one on uh, supply chain here at some point. Might have been the previous presentation, but it was the previous presentation. On, yeah, there's one on, you know, different supply chain caveats and stuff where, um, the ranges are enormous and even experts vehemently disagree. And so like, you'll see, you know, Elon Musk saying refining is the bottleneck and you'll see all the miners and benchmark minerals going, no, it, it's, it's, it's mining. And then when you bring in the direct lithium extraction, which is effectively both and you're integrating, which we got a slide on, we'll get to eventually, I promise that helps with this a lot too, but this is sort of the traditional, you build a mine the mine ships, the, you know, finished ore product or, or, you know, couple percent lithium salt product to a refiner halfway across the planet. And then they have to build the refining capacity and basically, and they have to build a refinery around your specific input. And if you're doing that traditionally, this is, this is what it looks like. And it's very slow and it's hard yeah. and it's expensive. Like, and also remember guys, regardless of the industry, copy paste does not exist. You can't be like, I solved it at one location. I'm going to move this to a different factory site and everything is going to work. Texas Gigafactory is a great example of them just scrapping the living hell out of everything, right? They just made their first Cybertruck. When was Elon saying the Cybertruck was going to be in production? Like seven years ago, six years ago, right? Like copy paste just doesn't exist in manufacturing. It's the same for semi. It's the with, same with for cars. complex products. Yeah. The caveat is complex products. <laughs> the caveat is complex. So like, for example, every semi site is a long thing because you can't do yeah, it. And, and that's why we're saying that Xiao Jing um, is, is, you know, for the, especially for the lithium, again, like you're basically completely changing the chemistry of what the input is, what the process is, what and what the output product is, and then expecting someone else to buy that different output product. And the difference in even the the subgrades in the exact same lithium metal grade or lithium um, you know battery grade materials they're huge and they make a huge difference in the performance and so people are very picky and they want high reproducibility and and very high purity and very high control over stuff and just a tiny bit of one extra material left over from the toxicity in the salt and sea for an example that kills it. it it might make your you know when you're doing when you're jumping off to the battery stuff it might make your mixes gel it might destroy your clumping efficiency for cycle efficiency cycle life like you just you you can't have it so anyway yeah i'm gonna I'm... jump to the uh, next one before we get too derailed with yeah. questions on this one but so we, we we didn't get to this before the end of the last one, but really the thing we want to highlight for this, for basically the entire lithium industry, right? So what it's used for, the mining, refining, and everything is basically the whole goal of the whole thing is to help us get to the idea of sort of the net zero for emissions and pollution. And, it, uh, you know, the, the, the big thing is, you know, the, the overall arching goal is you replace fossil fuel energy generation across the board with renewables, which needs storage to be fully enabled, but that's a topic for a different time. We're going to kick that down the road and just talk about the, the EVs for now. But, and then EVs basically in every form for buses, for trains, for cars, for scooters, for mopeds, for every form of ICE equivalent vehicle that is used, you replace the generation during usage of the ICE with a huge upfront extra cost and extra pollution cost for mining the materials and making the battery. So when, right off the production, if you never drive internal combustion engine vehicles, they're way more efficient than EVs because the EVs take so much upfront to make the battery packs. And so you have this giant upfront cost. And also right now, because the materials are being mined 
on one you know continent and shipped across to another continent for refining and then shipped to a third one to make a battery and or a pack and or a car and then that's being shipped somewhere else the logistic supply chain for this is also pretty horrendous right now and so the, the way that you'll see if it pencils out over time is really going to depend on kind of shortening those supply chain logistics integrating and probably also recycling and we have to see if that's going to happen or not otherwise we're actually produce, polluting a lot more than we would be with ICEs over the yeah. short to medium term and it's not even pollution guys it's also economics right like look at it from this viewpoint the new Chevy Silverado EV is 79 grand uh a Toyota Camry is 27 grand and it gets a combined 32 miles per gallon you could say I own eat both vehicles for the next 10 years. You would still have something like a $30,000 Delta. And we're assuming that you're not even paying for electricity for your EV. Right. And I also, in that math, I forgot to mention, that's assuming gas is $10 a gallon. You cannot make financial justification of an EV. Yeah. And, and so the other that's, piece here. That's a very, uh, that's a very, particular example you give for for the North American market, Jeff. I mean, uh, the Silverado probably has a 140 kilowatt hour battery pack and the Cam and the Camry weights like 2000 kilos. Come on, it will never it will never happen. You know, the 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 car industry is going to cars that have so, a battery pack of 30 kilowatt hours so, so you, and cars that weigh under a thousand kilos. So no, no, let but us let's, finish, that's kind yeah. of our next two slide point, Sergio. <laughs> yeah, but like basically even Sergio at a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack, the math still doesn't pencil out because everybody posts their EV tax credits is the only way to make them financially affordable compared to a normal fuel efficient like hybrid or ICE, yeah. right? So, so just finishing up real quickly, my, the favorite thing I found, which I, I don't have a way to share the video clip of, but the favorite thing I found while we were doing the research for this was a great quote by uh, Professor Thea Rio Francos, who's associate professor of political science at Providence College. And she was in this video on Albemarle's basically lithium industry uh, impact. And one of the things she says is that, you know, you can get to zero emissions with well, much less mining, which, which again, it's, it's highly polluting. It takes lots of water. There's high, high environmental impacts for pretty much every version of mining or high capex, you know, for the, for, the D, uh, for the direct lithium extraction processes. But we can get there with much less mining meaning we need less lithium, if we can make some changes to public policy and to consumer habits, rather than just try to electrify the status quo of like really large cars and everyone needing to go own an individual car to get to where they want to go. And so that's exactly this point is we do not need to have a, you know, electric truck with a 140 kilowatt hour battery pack for every person on the planet. There's no possible way that that makes sense, right? So less cars that are now EVs, smaller battery packs. And so for the final slide, potential solutions, right? So what are kind of the things to think about and look at and aim for in this whole mess? Because right now it is a mess. There, there's the goal, there's the pathway to the goal. And right now, depending on what pathways are taken and whether they include things like recycling or efficient you know, trade routes for these different materials or vertical integration locally, it actually might be worse for the environment than just continuing what we were doing with ICEs in the short to medium term, maybe even the long term. So what can we do? And a number of things are one, you know, just regulatory, getting some of the mines and stuff opened faster really is really critical. Mining and refining being supported by the local state and federal governments in all the different countries is really critical. And, and the, D, the DLE sites, which are being funded by the IRA and some other things, getting any of those up faster so we can get the lithium faster, cheaper, and, and, and more efficiently and more environmentally is very important. Technology, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of different DLE companies with different approaches, with you know, similar but fundamentally different processes and technologies that they're deploying. And basically, they need to be able to deploy those successfully and economically to help you know, the other problems with, you know, the, the hard rock mining and the, you know, brine uh, 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 ponds, which we didn't cover as much, but hard rock mining, you mine, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of rock to get the one ton of rock that has the lithium in it. And, and for the, for the brines, they use so much water, which, which they're not directly covered, but those are both highly pollutive and disruptive activities. Um, and so having the technology be able to be deployed economically 
which these have very high CapEx costs, as you saw in, in one of our previous slides. So things like the IRA or other larger funding from companies that need the lithium is really needed to help push things forward. And we are seeing some of that, which is good news. And then as Sergio you know, helped us uh, uh, mention uh, early before we could get to it, thanks for stealing our thunder, buddy. The, the market and consumer preferences really need to shift, right? Not everyone needs a giant battery pack with 600 miles of range for a giant car. That is, that is not efficient. If the goal is environmental net zero emissions, you can't do that. We don't all get to have 140 kilowatt hour battery pack. There's one, there's not enough lithium. <laughs> and two, it's highly disruptive and not sustainable and not economic and not environmental to do that. So we'll, we'll see a lot of things with that, I think, coming up in the future with better charging infrastructure and more fast charging and some other stuff like that. But um, ultimately, the, the battery packs need to be smaller. And we need to explore things that are not a give every person on the planet an EV as a solution to our transportation needs. And a preface to our next video is recycling. So recycling of lithium and other battery materials is also highly critical. And we will be talking a lot more about the specifics of that in our part three, which is lithium um, recycling, which we're gonna be partnering with um, Luke and Erica of Redivivius and uh, Electric Goddess to help us do that. And Luke, you wanna say one or two words on your guys' stuff right now, if I'm not putting you on the spot? I, I just wanted to mention, um... With respect to the efficiency of those processes, I, I noticed you mentioned a lot of the literature may say 90% extraction efficiency or whatever, but what's done in practice is 70%. Um, most of these processes, you can operate them in a way where you achieve a very high extraction efficiency, you know, 90 or 95 by rerunning multi-pass uh, extraction and concentrating effluent to re-extract. You know, you can, you can pull almost everything but it's not profitable. yeah. And so uh, it's efficiency is that balance in, and in recycling too. It's constantly that balance of what is the, the return on investment relative to getting an extra 2% of the materials extracted, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a delicate balance there. And, and, Luke, and Luke, who is an expert on this, is going to be helping us with our next presentation on that topic. But, but again, you know, the the, the sheer amount of lithium, the, the amount of earth we're mining and, and the amount of water we're using to get the lithium if it's not being plugged back in with recycling to the, you know, the, the industry, that's a big problem. It's then a disposable product. If you're using pyrolization to recycle the metals, you're just burning it. It's gone. You've got to get new lithium. And then this is a never ending cycle of basically just strip mining the planet for lithium, which will not be a net zero emissions solution in the medium to long term. So that's one of the biggest issues is how do you recycle the lithium and how do you maybe use it more responsibly and less? And the last piece is, is sort of, you're seeing some of it happen right now where companies like Tesla are getting into lithium mining and refining where basically there's enormous margins. And, and the limiting factor video that talks about that shows the like 90 plus percent margins right now in miners and refiners for lithium in the space that they're just enormous right now. And so companies basically vertically integrating not just their supply chain in-house, but within the same country area. So you have the mining and then refining and hopefully also the battery making or car making in similar places. Because again, the logistic shipping of, you know, the ore from one place to the refiner somewhere else, to the battery maker somewhere else, to the pack being used to the car somewhere else, to the final product of the car, that's also very bad for the environment. Um, so that's something else that we really need to look at in terms of both cost reduction, which will not be passed to the consumer. We all know how this works. It's just going to be swallowed by the company. But at least what we might get is reduced pollution from those logistics supply chain, giant, enormous, you know, tens of thousands of mile chains being reduced. And that is the end of our presentation. And we've got a link of other resources, and we'll throw a couple more on here. We didn't quite finish this morning, but um, a couple really good videos. Again, the um, Limiting, uh, limiting factor video, uh, part one just came out last week. Absolutely fantastic. Can't recommend that enough. Um, the second one with Albemarle talks a little bit more about some specifics. And that's the one I got that wonderful quote from on electrifying the status quo, which I'm going to use forever. I really liked. And then um, th this first one goes over some of the specific uh, um, direct lithium extraction companies and processes and their sites and what they're doing. And I thought that was very interesting. And that's why I'm picking on uh, Lilac because that's the only example of a like failed project in that video that I'm aware of. So thank you everyone so much. And uh, please look forward to our um, next part three video, which will be next month, about August, I think 15th, the next Battery Brunch. And now 
Now, Jim, it's 10 minutes, not five. I apologize. Shoot your question over. 